My views and, you know, my approach to science and engineering have been largely shaped by my experience in two great institutions. I was fortunate to spend uh, 27 years of my career at Bell Laboratories. I was a primary in, uh, in uh, industrial laboratory where, you know, many fundamental discovery in science and technology uh, happened, you know, from the transistor, the laser, the discovery of the Big Bang. And in the last 10 years here, here, here at Harvard, so watching the landscape of science uh, from these two outposts has been a great uh, experience which has shaped my views. So I would say um, science has dramatically changed in the last uh, uh, 10 years and the change is even is more and more rapid. You see, I would say that originally modern science started as uh, modern, I mean, uh, in the uh, uh, 19th century, it started to be organized in uh, the sort of uh, model of departments, uh, university de uh, uh, departments separated in actually various disciplines which reflected the way that science started to be carried out, you know, after the actual Renaissance, high, special, high specialization. That was very important, and it carried us through up to, up to the actual 20th century, but then the 21st century, and things are changing. So what you now, you, uh, you notice, and it's fascinating, a convergence between this previously separate uh, discipline I work in nanoscale science and uh, technology, and this is a field where this convergence is uh, uh, apparent. When we start to study things at the nanoscale, we see that we can't really separate, you know, what's chemistry, what's physics, what biology. And so, again, you have this interdisciplinary melding or molding together, okay? Because science, the way it's carried out, uh, change, it calls for a different approach in the way we, not only we carry out science, but we organize science. So the vision of the future is that the modern uni, u, university has to be different. No more the type of silos by discipline, the chemistry silos, the physics, but more an interconnectness between the actual silos which reflects the way science is uh, a, uh, evolving. So this intellectually is very exciting. There is another uh, thing that I want to mention. The other thing is that, uh, unfortunately, you know, when science started, if you look at the great men of science, uh, the founders, you know, Galileo, Newton, Leonardo, and there is a whole, these people were both uh, engineers, and scientists at the same time. I and mean, you know, Galileo invented the scientific method with Bacon, yes, he made major de uh, dis dis discoveries, but one needs to realize that he wrote uh, his famous treaty on the philosophy of science because he built a telescope with his own hands and made these discoveries. At the origin, there wasn't this separation between engineering and science or between technology. Over the years, it started to be separated, partly by necessity. I mean, what I've been advocating, and now it's a real trend, we need to break down these artificial barriers, not only between disciplines, but uh, uh, between what's applied and actual basics. You know, to my students, I have a way to say, which is pictorial, but I think it's useful. And he says that nature does not know what is uh, biology, what is uh, physics, what is chemistry. These are artificial distinctions that are very useful to organize knowledge. But when you, uh, when you tackle a problem, these distinctions often do not help. Making a hierarchy, this is applied, so I'm not going to touch it. And this is basic, so it's fascinating. Oh, this is engineering, sorry. I mean, this is, this is not only anachronistics. It doesn't uh, educate young people well. Why? Because today we have major problems that we must solve. So I advocate an approach of problem solving in science, you know. 
we shouldn't be going after disciplines in particular, though, but about problems to solve. And we should train students educationally also, you know, to think about this is a fascinating problem. It has different components. Some might come traditionally from chemistry, biology, physics. And I think uh, when one takes this approach, uh, you know, uh, it's not only intellectually re, uh, re, uh, rewarding, but it's the way to go in the future. I mean, you know, let's talk about climate change. And you know, I talk about climate change because I'm collaborating here at Harvard with science, scientists involved in climate change studies. That field belongs to all disciplines, right? And that's why it needs training and an educational uh, approach that is different from the silos type of approach. Yes, problem solving is important. And uh, what I've seen now, I can give a, a specific kind of a, a example. Again, I was brought up in uh, the culture of Bell Laboratories. Uh, and when I arrived here at Harvard, I found uh, a happy place to be because it's very interdisciplinary. And in my approach to science, I have, all, I have taken a designer point of view. Who is a designer? A designer uh, traditionally is uh, someone that uh, conceives certain structures that you do not find in uh, nature, typically, and you sort of play. And you play by pulling together different things, like a designer taking a car designer. A designer of cars is both an engineer, at least needs to know elements of engineering, needs to know elements of science, right? needs to have some aesthetic, has to be an artist at the same time. So what do I mean by designer science? Well, uh, you know, uh, at the end we need to be a bit uh, uh, specific in uh, the way that I approach uh, uh, science, in particular in my field, you know, I spent a significant part of my career designing new materials, exploiting what uh, the crystal growers you know, could grow these ultra thin layers, I, f uh, I found an approach, you know, on how uh, to design materials with properties that do not exist in uh, nature. And again, in this type of approach of designer science or designer physics, you know, you're pulling together elements from different disciplines, material science, physics, and engineering, sometimes chemistry, and you are creating novel combination. So that's the science part, the invention. Then out of new combination, you've got to ask yourself the question, can I do something useful with it, right? And that comes the engineering side. So in all my career, I've tried always straddle the gap. It's not a gap, really. I don't think it's a gap. And in people, in many, in the minds of many people, it's unfortunate there is a gap, you know, between engineering technology and uh, fundamental science. So this philosophy, I found it at Bell Labs, which was very exciting, has informed my career. I find it also here in Harvard more and more. So then I moved on to other things and I said, after designing materials, uh, semiconductors to make interesting novel devices, what else can I do? Well, uh, I started to look at quantum fluctuation, you know, the, the vacuum uh, fluctuates with energy. This is quantum mechanics, it's called zero point energy. And uh, these fluctuations cause forces between macroscopic body. A famous force is the Casimir force. So I asked myself, can we design the shape of these bodies, of these surfaces that interact to engineer these quantum forces? So this is another type of engineering, still designer physics. And, uh, and, you know, in the recent years has been uh, uh, fascinating. I have a very creative group. I'm blessed with having a very creative group. And uh, together we have started to revisit, you know, the old laws of optics. By all laws of optics, we have all studies in high school, Snell, Snell's law that says when light hits on a surface and it enters in, a, in, the, uh, in, in the actual medium uh, below, how is it? deflected, or uh, Cartesius law, that is the uh, reflection, light comes off a surface reflected to you. So this is high school stuff. 
But I told, you know, my people, we should really look at some of these. What happens? And so what we have found is that if we engineer, if we structure these surfaces at a scale as much smaller than the wavelength, something fascinating happens. Okay, we found generalized laws of reflection and uh, refraction. We have generalized the old 17th century law that well known. We found that these new laws still can be brought under a bigger law, which is well known. It's Fermat's principle that light follows the path of minimum time between two points. And so out of this, you know, we are, uh, I would say, creating this field, which we like to call flat optics. This is the basic science I told you about, but now we are going into practical direction. My students have made a beautiful flat lens, which has many advantages. So in some sense, we are revisiting optics. I'm saying we are looking at optics in, a, in an actually new light. And the new light, yes, it's designer optics. You see, again, how can we tailor the basic properties using artificial structure to create uh, new phenomena and then use them for something. So this is sort of what I mean by designer science. One can ask about, uh, you know, impact of this uh, approach to uh, design. And I can talk about impact of the, these areas that I uh, described to you and this designer uh, uh, material science, where we design material has uh, uh, led us at Bell Labs, continuing here to the invention of a new class of laser, which are called quantum cascade laser, which the community considers are revolutionary lasers, which can emit any kind of uh, wavelength in the infrared by design, you see. You specify the revolutionary point is the following. Usually if you take a laser, if you want to, the wavelength that comes out depends on the material of the laser. This is so obvious, we don't think about it anymore. This laser is fundamentally new because the wavelength is primarily determined uh, not by the choice of the material, by the thickness of the actual layer. So by tailoring the thickness of the layer in a nanometer scale, we can change the wavelengths across the whole infrared spectrum. From, you know, we are talking a few micron up to 100 micron. And this has opened up an entire uh, field of research in spectroscopy. These uh, lasers are now flown by my colleagues in atmospheric uh, chemistry. They have, they have done some fundamental studies of the distribution of trace gases in the troposphere and in the stratosphere, which are absolutely central to uh, the understanding uh, and prediction of climate, which is the most critical thing, right? The other area, you know, which we have uh, future flat optics, I don't know, it's open research, but I believe it can have a profound impact on technology because uh, the technology is actually simpler than the existing one. And you know, I can give you an example. I can ask you a question. Can we make a, a smartphone as thick as a credit card? That's the question they asked me when we came up with the flat lens. Someone from a big company called me, says, we're interested in this. I said, why are you interested? And he asked me, he asked me that question. I said, I don't understand. Says, Professor Capasso, the thickness of a smartphone, one of the limiting factors is the thickness of the actual lens. As you guys have shown, if I now make it so thin, I can probably squeeze the whole phone down. Right? And so there are a lot of application of this uh, uh, potentially uh, flat optics, and it's taken off uh, like a rocket since we started this research. The most exotic one on quantum fluctuation, I don't know. But you know, my experience there is this. If you do exciting new science, in the future, either you or someone else finds important applications that were unpredictable when the discovery uh, was done. For example, the people describe the laser as uh, the solution looking for a problem. So in summary, I advocate 
a problem solving approach to science and engineering, okay, which means breaking down the barriers between disciplines, breaking down the barriers between so-called basic science and, up, and uh, application. And uh, a w designer science, in fact, is sort of a way to implement these approaches in, this approach in many different fields. <music>